So we're exactly a month away until Christmas. Now maybe some of you today thinking, okay, it's, it's uh, one month until Christmas. I've got to start doing Christmas cards. Now some of the famous images of Christmas entail scenes of the three wise men, an ox, and a donkey. Now for some of you have Bibles that you're carrying either in your bags or purses or in your phones. And if you go to the first two chapters of Matthew's Gospel, the infancy narratives, see if you can find out if there's an actual reference to ox and donkeys in it. There are not. So where do they come from? Well, this is also part of, of you know, the, the theology of St. Matthew's Gospel in that it seems that those who should see the Lord don't and those who should not see the Lord don't. Specifically, the reference from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3. The ox knows its owner, and the ass its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people does not understand. So even though Matthew's gospel is, is the most Jewish of all the gospels, yet he acknowledges that, that the Jewish people refuse our Lord. And so the two animals... Uh, kind of symbolize what, what happens. Uh, that They symbolize the blindness that some people can have. But ultimately, it is the, the, the newborn king who, who brings light to the world. And so part of Christian iconography with regards to Christmas has the image of the ox and donkey for the specific reason of the importance of seeing. Now, a char- the characters, as I mentioned, that actually appear in Matthew's infancy narrative are the three wise men. And it's interesting that they see, but the Jewish scholars and leaders don't see. In fact, they follow a star to the place of our Lord. And they see so profoundly who this Jesus is, they give him three gifts. Frankincense, to, as, a, as a, a mark that he is God because incense is used for worship that he is given uh, myrrh to, to uh, foreshadow his death it was an embalming medicine they also give, they give him gold because he's a king so the wise men see our Lord and recognize him as Christ the king as a newborn child and I think likewise with us Christ the king makes us see him in the world. Now, unlike the, unlike the, the sense that uh, there are no animals of, let's say, ox and donkeys in the Matthew uh, infancy narrative, but there are animals in Matthew's gospel, and we encounter them today, goats and sheep. Now, I'm not a farmer. Many of you are not farmers yourselves. So you think, well, what's the difference between goats and sheep? Well, goats and sheep are ungulates, which means they're hooved animals. I mean, they have that similarity. And even when the Jewish temple was in existence, both sheep and goats were used in sacrifice. But why does our Lord see the righteous as like sheep and the unrighteous as goats? Well, I think some of the characteristics when I was doing a little bit of research on that are such that sheep are meek and mild, that they're inoffensive and easily led. They're mild, simple, intelligent, patient, and useful. And male sheep will even make a point of looking out for the concern of the herd, specifically their their mate. And so they do that. Now, in contrast, goats are naturally mischievous, wayward, quarrelsome, innately selfish. And so male goats did not protect their mates from other males. And so much so that the sense of the the selfishness of goats kind of permeated ancient Greek culture. That goats symbolized those who had loose morals, such as even the, the, the lesser gods of Pan, Bacchus, and Aphrodite. The Jews hated the symbol of the goat, for it represented a disobedient and undisciplined lifestyle. And I think a wonderful illustration of the contrast between goats and sheep in terms of the sense of being selfish and selfless. Now when sheep feed on grass, they leave a couple centimeters above the the ground so that the the grass can return naturally. 
Goats don't. They devour everything. Now, if one has a, has a yard infested with, with weeds, it's good. Get rid of the weeds, but they'll, they'll devour everything. Shrubs, tree bark, leaves, everything. And so the analogy, I think, has the sense of being able to see that this that selfless nature, presumably, of sheep is such that when they eat the grass, they're leaving enough for it to grow for the future and for others to use. And that the sheep are guided by their innocence, their patience, and mildness. They also look for one another, look out for one another as a herd. And so they ensure that none, no one will be lost in, in amongst them by being together. Because so the, the, their selflessness is able to see the benefit of another. Now, in contrast, the selfishness of goats, they're destructive. And it's also symbolic of those who only seek their own self-interest and who are guided by their own, their own selfishness, ripping up the roots of charity, joy, and even self-absorbed to the point of, of take away the bounty of creation to prevent others from enjoying it. So the, the degree in which we become selfless, the more that we can see. So Christ the King makes us see him in the world. Now for the past couple of months, I've encouraged all of us to consider this passage from Luke's Gospel, put out into the deep and wait for a catch. So it's based on Luke chapter 5, the call of Peter. Peter has been working all night, and Jesus tells Peter, put your nets into the deep and wait for a catch. And I say this because we're celebrating our 60th anniversary of the parish in, in, in 2019. And so it's wonderful to say how many people, thousands of people, have put their nets into the deep. And even our three who want to be baptized, who want to have Christ reign in their lives, how many have poured, put down their nets for a catch? And the Lord always provides as an inspiration towards the future. And so when the hall of fish comes into Peter's boat, Peter gets on his knees of all things and says, Lord, get away from me for I'm a sinful man. Jesus tells him, you will know, don't be afraid. You'll be catching people now. And they left everything and followed our Lord. And so where does the Lord ask us today to follow him. Now, by virtue of living on the west end of Calgary, for many of us, many of us will not encounter the miserable of society, the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the imprisoned. We live a pretty sheltered life from, from those who really suffer. But Jesus, I think, the, the message that he sends, especially with regards to the, to the judgment of the nations, all peoples will be judged to the degree in which one has done something for the least of the brothers and sisters. And so who are the miserable in, in our lives? The ones that maybe are, don't necessarily apply to the six in the categories of today's gospel. Well, what about one's co-worker? What about a street person? What about the people who cut us off when we're driving? How uncharitable we can become. What about a spouse? What about a sibling? A friend? I mean, there are many others that we can say that they're miserable. I hate them. Well, Jesus says, when you do it to at least these brothers and sisters of mine, you do it to me. And the sense of judgment is that Jesus is present not only amongst us believers who have been saved, and not only to other Catholics, but to everyone. And so he's present in the, in the disfigured disguise of the poor, the, the imprisoned, the naked, the hungry, and the sick, and even those that we don't like but all the more that we have to open ourselves. And if we look at the nature of goats, their selfishness, they become so self-absorbed, they don't see anybody else. But the nature of the sheep are those who are selfless. They're innocent, they're gentle, they can be led, they look after one another. And they leave a little, a little grass left so it'll continue to grow, to leave a legacy, leave something positive. So ultimately, if we want to be uh, the sheep of Christ's fold, then we have to have the adopt the model of, uh, the attributes of, of the sheep and leave the world better by virtue of our selflessness so we can better, in turn, see the needs of others. So with Christmas one month away, while we write our Christmas cards and have images of donkeys and oxen and the three wise men, let's note that they represent something much more than those who see, but really those who don't see. As, we, as I mentioned in, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3. 
The ox knows its owner, the ass its master's crib, but Israel does not know me. My people do not understand. And surprisingly, the ones who do see the humble, like the sheep, are not the Jewish leaders in Matthew's gospel in the infancy narrative or the scholars, but Gentile wise men who travel thousands of kilometers to follow a star to encounter the Lord, whom they acknowledge themselves as king. And so through the word of the Lord and the body and blood, let's allow Christ once again to reign in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives, so we can truly see him and serve him disguised in the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, and those we don't get along with. Then we will get a Christmas gift beyond all imagining that the Lord will call us to eternal life and we may inherit the kingdom prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Christ the King makes us see him in the world.